Good evening, everyone. Uh, I am disabling the waiting room so that uh, people can join on their own. Uh, can you all hear hear me? Uh, can you hear Manoj as well? Hi, I have to speak if they have to hear me. So, uh, good evening, everyone. Good evening. Yeah. Yeah. Good evening. Good evening. Yeah. So we'll get started, and then uh, it's already two minutes past four thirty. So. We usually have an agenda wherein we cover the markets, we cover the macros first, and then we, you know, get into any specific uh, stock level aspects. Uh, given the time we have this time, and given that most people are interested in the market uh, levels, and you know, uh, should we exit now? When is the bottom likely? Uh, should we have exited uh, six months back and entered now? A lot of questions uh, that some people have. Very, very natural that these questions are there because uh, there seems to be some uh, despondency and some uh, despair about the market movements. Uh, so therefore, uh, what we'll do is we'll spend more time uh, on the markets. Uh, we'll also try to compare with what has happened in the past uh, historically. And, uh, uh, you know, we'll share our views uh, uh, you know, in terms of how market has, uh, has performed in the past. Um, so I'm, we are using a few uh, charts because this discussion is going to be more number oriented. Um, I hope all of us, all of you can see the, uh, the presentation that is being laid out. Uh, can you all see this? Right. So, yes. So Brian and Pankaj of Karpa. So, uh, so this is the standard agenda. That, but what we'll do is this time, um, uh, you know, cover these points. Um, I will uh, now hand it over to Manoj, who will uh, walk us through majority of the slides, and I'll pitch in wherever uh, he asks me to. Over to you, yeah okay so we get started uh, today and uh, uh, as ram said uh, i'm sure not uh, many would be interested in knowing what is the covid scenario and what the rbi is doing and all that the usual stuff that we talk about so we'll jump straight away into the markets um, see what we are probably uh, sharing today is not new, definitely not to the seasoned investors who have been investing in equity. However, you know, we believe that uh, you know, uh, maybe we, we will probably reassure that we are also uh, having the same thought process and we are essentially emphasizing on the basics, the cardinal principles of investing and uh, as we go along, we'll take a few questions also. Uh, it is very important for us to believe in what we are doing. Okay. We, we will see a lot of charts. We will see a lot of ups and downs. There's a lot of volatility. Uh, there is despair. There is questioning of strategy. But if you do not believe in what you are doing, then there is very less likelihood of we succeed. We, we've stuck to our investment philosophy of roots and wings. Uh, we have a model, we have a system, an algorithm that helps us uh, do what we are doing. Uh, and it is important for us, particularly as your advisors, to have conviction in what we are doing. Uh, and we would like to tell you that we are convinced about what we are doing. And at this point in time, there is no need to react and there is no need to give into a panic-like situation. And we will see why. Ram, next slide, please. Okay, so today we will not uh, you know, we, we will look at the market indices as a whole. You know, 
uh, at least uh, to start with, let us see how markets have been behaving over a long period of time. Okay, so here you see a chart from 2005 to 2022, which gives you monthly returns. These are monthly returns, month on month returns. And if you see these numbers, you will see a lot of variation, you know, ranging from say minus 20% to plus 20%, etc. These are monthly numbers. So this tells you the extent of volatility in the market. Now let us move to the next slide and see how these numbers behave once we look at annual numbers. Ram, next slide, please. Okay, we, we have similar numbers for the small cap also, but uh, uh, and the moment you come to small cap, the numbers, the variation further increases. You know, now you are minus 30% to plus whatever, etc. So huge variation on a month on month basis. Next round. Now let us look at the annual returns. Now the numbers look much more saner. And while you have, again, a lot of fluctuations, you know, annual one year returns of 75% to negative returns of 50% in one year. Okay, 30% returns in one month is much more higher than a 50 or 70% return in a year. Okay, so why even these numbers are very high, you see that the the volatility has significantly reduced. And what is important to note is that out of 33 years data you know, from 92 to 2022, just about three years, sorry, nine years, we've had a negative return. Most of the years, this is a calendar year. Most of the times we have had positive returns. Sometimes it could be very low, only 3% returns, but sometimes it is high more than 60% returns, 70% returns. From next. Now we increase the period a little more and now look at three year rolling returns. Now you have to understand what does rolling returns mean? Rolling returns mean any point in time to any point in time over three year period, you know? It keeps changing. We are not talking of like the previous slide was calendar years, 1995, 96, 97, etc. Here we are talking of overlapping period. And if you see the overlapping period, uh, Ram, I want the slides. Uh, I'm sorry, or maybe you can. Uh... Yes, I was just trying to look at the number of data points, uh, Mano. Yeah. The number of data points that this particular slide uh, covers is 175. So there are 175 months of three-year rolling returns captured. So for example, uh, December 2007, three-year returns till then. Jan 2007, three years return till then. Feb 2007, three years till then. So on till June 2022. So that is 175 data points. And you see that the variation that uh, Manoj was talking has somewhat reduced. And uh, we've always advised investors to stay put in equities for at least three years, ideally five years. And uh, you will see that in this chart, there are times where the returns have been negative on a three year basis, which have coincided with uh, significant uh, bear markets. So the first one is the global financial crisis that you see here, the uh, where you see the mouse. Another was in 2013, uh, and uh, the other one is in COVID. Uh, other than that, all the rolling three-year returns are positive. Uh, now you forward this to five years, and whatever trend Manoj was saying, that will get further uh, clarified. Manoj? Yeah. So you already made the point, Ram. Uh, so now when we look at a five-year return period, this is again rolling. 
so it's not about when you have entered when you have exited any five year period you will see that not even once not even once have we recorded a negative return i know negative return or or you know maybe a 3% or a 5% return may not mean much but you know most of the times the first thing that that is on top of our mind is am i losing capital you know returns come later but the first thing particularly the indian investor psychology is that i will wait for any number of years but i do not want to sell at loss i just you know we do not subscribe to that uh, thought process but nevertheless you will see that even you know less than 5% returns is for a very very short period of time and the median uh, the median return uh, if you see on rolling 3 year this is for nifty index we also have how our own strategy would have performed before 2019 had it been live uh, and post 2019 anyway we have actual data so the um, so there is a slide that that is going to come actually here i i'm going ahead of myself but uh, the average return on a rolling 3 year basis for nifty uh, has been about 13 point um, Uh, sorry 12.2% so 12.2% on a rolling 3 year basis the average of those charts and for bsc small cap it's actually lower 8% only but then bsc small cap is a is a volatile index the re- only reason why we are including that for comparison here is because as you all know we run two strategies one is jewel which is a large mid cap strategy for which nifty 50 is a reasonable benchmark and the second one is spark for which bsc small cap is a reasonable benchmark so the number of data points on a 5 year basis are around 160 odd data points we have and uh, uh, this is the bsc small cap uh, chart manoj yeah uh, so uh, again so what we have seen till now is that as we increase the period which we are looking at we will see the markets kind of streamlining the volatility has reduced and instead of uh, you know a, a roller coaster kind of a ride we see a more smoothened out returns that are coming as we increase the period now we have had, we have 10 year charts and uh, uh, you know 20 year charts also but uh, i think the point is made here in terms of how the markets perform see if you are an equity investor it is very important that we we are committed to the market you know an equity investor is a part owner in the business and a part owner is not going to enter and exit a business just on the basis of day to day movements now while we have looked at the uh, nifty charts we will briefly look at the uh, small cap uh, index also the three year rolling returns now if you compare it with the nifty you will have a much larger period below zero that means there have been larger instances of small cap index giving negative returns but even this when you move to a five year period ram can you just move to the next slide Yeah. this number significantly reduces so what is the lesson that we are taking from this uh, yeah uh, essentially the one quality that we need to make money create wealth in the equity markets is patience you know you will have to bide your time you know it is often said that the portfolio of the dead outperforms the portfolio of the living and the underlying logic is the same the dead cannot make changes to their portfolio again this is only to highlight the a particular point as you all know we do not subscribe to that we we do make changes because we believe in a buy and review strategy rather than a buy and hold strategy but it makes a lot of sense for us to be conscious 
that the markets will throw up these kind of returns and there will be innumerable reasons as to why this is happening okay let us so this is one aspect that i wanted to highlight in terms of how the markets are giving returns using two indices we are not talking of a specific portfolio or a particular fund or a pms or anything we are talking about the broad market taking two indices which are the most representative of the market from next we now move to another aspect which is the pe multiple price earnings multi multiple now i will take a step back and explain this conceptually so that we just so what is a pe ratio and i will explain pe ratio in the context of a bank fixed deposit so let us say you go to a bank and make a one year fixed deposit which gives you 10% per annum okay just for example purposes please no bank today is giving 10% per annum and if there is one please avoid that now what does it mean it means the fixed deposit has a face value of 100 and after one year when you redeem it you get 100 rupees only for the amount that you have deposited on that 100 rupees you are getting 10 rupees in other words to earn 10 rupees you have to make an investment of 100 the price you have to pay to earn a return of 10 rupees is 100 so if i divide the price by my interest 100 by 10 then it comes to 10 that is what is a price earnings multiple how many times more do i have to pay to earn 1 rupee so if a bank deposit is giving 10% returns then the pe is 10 if the bank deposit is giving only 5% then the pe of the bank deposit is 20 please make a note of this number the bank deposit offering 5% returns the price earnings multiple of that fixed deposit is 20 and as many of you are aware today even after the increased interest rates banks are not offering more than 5% post tax so your bank p supposedly one of the safest most liquid investments today is having a pv pe in excess of 20 and what is the p of nifty again we are talking only index if you see the slide the the red line is the pe multi the blue line is the actual nifty uh, index which we have already seen in terms of 3 year 5 years etc you can see how the nifty has spiked over the years and this looks like very impressive but as ram said it gives a cagr of just about 12% what i will revert it to say 12% is wonderful returns this is the kind of returns that you will get if your investment investment is giving just 12% now now let it let us look at the pe multiple for these kind of returns sometimes which give annual returns of 70% excess what has been the pe now where people have been optimistic positive the p has gone to a high of 40 40.4 if i am not right wrong so that means to earn 1 rupee an investor is willing to pay 40 rupees make an investment of 40 rupees to get just 1 rupee in return today nifty pe stands at less than 19 can we move to the next slide ram i think that number is uh, there in the next slide ram okay before that so this gives you uh, yeah the next one please ha huh? uh, we'll go back to the previous slides but uh, this is again you know from 2005 to 2022 the monthly pe is etc 
but look at the and this is a very important slide that i wanted to highlight see the blue line and see the pattern before this during 2008-9 crisis that was the time when see if we have to look at two major uh, quote unquote bear markets one is the global financial crisis of 2008-9 and then the covid crisis that we experienced in 2020 we have, we have had many other bear markets and we'll talk about it but look at how the market p has performed over this period you know when people have p is more a uh, more symbolic of the sentiment of the investor you know the optimism or the pessimism of the investor with respect to markets so from a peak of 28.29 sorry ram the same slide which we were on yeah 28.29 the p fell to almost 11 and this was for a very short period within a very short period of time you know everybody uh, post lehman uh, brothers uh, declaring bankruptcy there was global crisis markets fell left right and center so everybody was very very pessimistic so from a p multiple perspective that was a nearly i think about 58 or 60 percent fall in p multiple i'm not talking of index fall i'm talking of the p multiple fall look at covid from a peak of about 29.9 it fell to about 17.15 so that was more than 40 percent fall so the two major sharp declines that you see in this chart we had 40 percent and about 60 percent now let us look at what is the current situation and can you go to the slide which has got that uh, small text i will yeah i will do that so i think uh, we may want to manoj would you like to address this point of uh, why did we not sell or advise an exit uh, six months back yeah uh, and because this chart kind of shows those very sharp edges and why it is so difficult to catch those edges um, you know uh, so I, maybe we may want to come back to this chart later I, I, i'll just uh, move to the next slide yeah just that uh, one slide where i made note about the piece that is what i was talking about some small text mm. Or doesn't matter I, I i'll talk about it here itself so now currently we are seeing a uh, p of about 18.9 or close to 19 from a peak of 42 that means we have corrected more than 50 percent in fact this is probably you know about 55 percent or so so that means a major amount of you know we, we are at the same pessimism levels that we were during the global financial crisis and during the covid crisis at no point in time anybody knows how the market is going to perform over the next one month three months six months five years ten years whatever okay but looking at all the numbers that we have we know that the markets have an upward trajectory but we have all these nice designs you know paint brushes going up and down up and down etc so these will give us indicators as to what the market is feeling and we will have to take a conscious call in terms of what should be our strategy during this period now any investor you know can tell with the benefit of hindsight that yeah you know you should have sold it when the market was at the peak and then re-entered when the market was at the bottom if i knew my numbers which i know it's like dhoni giving the ball to ishan sharma if he gets hit for three sixes then everybody will say dhoni doesn't know how to manage his bowlers and if ishan sharma takes a wicket everybody says brilliant captaincy only dhoni knows what is doing unfortunately Dhoni has to decide before the ball is being bowled whether Ishan Sharma has to be given the ball or not. So, 
we have to look at process you know this is something which is also talked about in cricket because i took the cricket analogy you know daily basis if we look at market and if we say that markets are doing like this like that etc you know my return is falling uh, what have i made you know it has fallen you know earlier it was so much now the number is more much so please look at the big picture and what is important at this point in time it's not that we are sleeping you know as your advisors we are equally concerned and we focus on what we are doing in far more greater, greater detail as to you know are things changing is there anything that we need to do etc so that is the point that i wanted to make through these two uh, uh, numbers now let us talk about bear markets from can we move to the third aspect of bear markets uh okay so we can skip the slide uh, yeah, yeah so we have covered this yeah in the interest of time we'll skip and if there are any questions yeah so if you see this slide you know uh, newspapers are very fond of uh, saying uh, you know blood on the lal street and you can see these kind of charts printed every time the markets fall you know earlier when sensex used to fall by 500 this kind of chart would be uh, printed on the front page now 500 points doesn't matter because it's a very small percentage but look at this and the next chart probably gives the numbers just move to the, uh, we could have only one slide but uh, somehow i wanted to show that previous slide now what does it drawdown mean drawdown means the extent of fall from the previous peak and if you see the maximum fall has been about 60 odd percent that means markets are capable of falling to very very large number good enough to shake some of the strongest believers in equity markets are what happened so much fall it is unprecedented so let us look at this and let us not say that it is unprecedented it has happened many times before that the markets have fallen over periods of time they have slid to these kind of numbers next slide ram and this will again give you you know during various bear market periods now i talked about two bear markets here we are talking about 7 to 8 this is because of a technical reason a bear market is technically defined as where the market is down by 20% from its peak so you seen these are the numbers where you know that 64.6% is also uh, shown here and it also this chart also tells you what is the time taken you know sometimes the bear markets are very small you know in 27 days there is a recovery sometimes it is 576 days that means close to 2 years and progressively we have seen that this period is shortened yeah go back to yes ram that ha huh. this is slightly dated we couldn't uh, update it but this is one of my favorite slides which i have been using for many you know uh, all uh, whenever i get an opportunity to do this now even if you are not able to read this the slide talks about why an investor should sell during that period every time the market has fallen and this is from 2009 and this is not even india this is dow jones every time there has been a crisis there is some big headline there is panic and then as a result the markets fall but see what has happened over this 10 week time the markets have gone up five times the dow jones industrial index uh, uh, average dji has gone up by five times over the last uh, over this period 2009 to 2019 okay as i told you it's little dated so if we focus on the short term the current event that is driving the markets then we are bound to fall to this and you know trigger the sell uh, option in panic and thereby lose out and 
very importantly you will never know i mean if anybody is claiming that they know when the markets are going to hit a peak and when the markets are uh, going to you know uh, uh, again turn back to positivity you know hit the trough i salute that person but honestly i will not believe that person it's not possible okay you can be right once or twice fluke but in order to do it you know even mathematically the probability of getting it right is just about 0.25 you know you have to anyway without going into that so if we look at the indices the way they have performed the returns that we are getting the optimism and pessimism surrounding it we get a clear message that it is important for us to be a little patient and believe in our strategy is our strategy right and that is where we now move to a comparison of okay this is how the markets have done how our portfolios have done uh ram next slide and maybe if you want you can take over this part the comparison of uh, jewel and yeah. spark with respect to indices yeah. yes so what is the slide you are seeing manoj on your screen i am seeing 21 jewel since inception yes so i'm see some of uh, uh, the folks on the call uh, may have may have a question uh, are jewel is not doing well in the last 6 months 8 months uh, etc uh, like manoj said a the markets will be at times testing our patience uh, i want to add that no one strategy will 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 always outperform every time so there will be times when a particular strategy will underperform and uh, you take any major uh, investor in the world and and check their track record you will find this and we are uh, uh, we are not claiming to be in their league but our view is that you know that's because if a particular strategy consistently outperforms then that strategy will get replicated and it will then you know stop outperforming so there will be a uh, time when you know like if you see here uh, you know from about october there has been our portfolio as uh, uh, in line with the markets the correlation between our portfolio and nifty uh, the jewel portfolio and nifty is about 97% and uh, which means that it tends to move Uh, up and down along with that now the quantum of up and down is something that that will vary uh over a longer period of time we have seen that we have comfortably outperformed since launch august 2019 we have delivered about 90% plus return absolute uh since august 2019 uh whereas nifty has returned about 55% okay um structurally the way uh global liquidity tends to move uh how it tends to move suddenly out of index stocks how that impacts other stocks these are factors you know what i'm saying is if if uh, based on the trends of liquidity certain stocks may go up and down but these will over time tend to even out uh so we are confident that Uh, our strategy uh, you know will bounce back uh, when the markets recover uh, it's a question of patience now uh, the stock markets uh, as as uh, somebody told uh, in the long run uh, they are weighing machines and in short run they are voting machines so the the stock market is a great uh, place where money gets moved from the impatient to the patient so over a since inception time period our jewel portfolio has done well second hello hello uh i am not able to hear let me just complete you may shoot your question on the chat window to me and i will answer that uh i already have a few questions which i'll answer um i will skip this bear market part uh, manoj Uh, for now uh, just summary is uh, yeah. summarized to say that you know 
we 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 have these case studies and it is all there on our website and you can see that across various bear market periods our portfolios both jewel and spark have done much better than their comparative indices that is the point which we wanted to highlight here uh, but ram carry on yeah but one has to be patient uh, you know and see through that that's that's our only point um there was one question that came to me saying certain sectors like auto and uh, capital goods and energy are doing well uh, see our philosophy in jewel is and jewel and spark is that we will stick to companies which are having consistently high return on equity often in many cases in the capital goods space uh, you know the return on equity is tend to be low so while they may uh, periodically flash up and flash down uh we want companies which are consistently giving high return on equity in excess of 15 to 18 to 20% and which are uh, consistently showing earnings growth now there are times when a particular stock may not deliver earnings growth in which case we we are we will wait for at least one quarter we don't churn for the sake of churning we tend to give a lot of thought before we exit a particular stock the only exception is when there is a corporate governance scenario like it happened with lux like it like it happened with divis last year wherein there was a corporate governance issue there was an indictment by sebi and uh, you know this we exited that stock uh, uh, but otherwise uh, we are patient if you see the last rebalancing that we did we exited only one pharma stock that too after checking that for 6 months we saw a dip in the earnings so uh our view is to basically look at the performance of the company and see the sector how it is doing and then give it a place in the portfolio now that uh, we are seeing a lot of pessimism in the market we've increased our portfolio from uh, in jewel from 22 stocks to around 24 stocks and in spark also we've increased it from 20 stocks to 25 stocks so that we diversify and reduce the risk to some extent um um i will move to the next slide here which is again the bear market this is another bear market uh, we have compared this is all historical data so i will um uh, this is the uh, rolling three year uh uh average rolling three year i think manoj already covered this i was looking up some other charts to see the data points so we have extensive data wherein we've seen how uh, various portfolios have performed and we'll be happy to share if anybody is interested uh, uh in in terms of further uh, uh breakdown but this is actually a a good moment to pause look at the valuation of the indices valuation of various stocks and decide to uh you know ideal increase exposure to equities at this stage definitely not a time to exit uh, manoj already more, uh, uh, answered that question as to you know why did we not exit at 17500 or 18000 because nobody can predict believe me if we knew how to predict we could have shorted the market and made a ton of money and nobody else has done it uh, uh, so there is an ace investor who's reputed to have lost 900 crores over a few days uh, so uh so yeah nobody can predict um now is equity the best asset class or are there other asset classes so on that point uh, i will hand it back to manoj on slide 27 right so uh, also keeping a watch on the time ram so yeah. i'll probably try and make it faster so what other alternatives are there for the normal investor you know one there is a lot of talk about uh, you know moving from equity to debt uh, now debt if you are holding bonds or debentures that is direct paper then your interest is fully taxable and you know we we've discussed this earlier also doesn't make sense if you are holding debt you know mutual funds are better because of the tax advantage now if you are ha- uh, holding mutual funds uh, that is debt funds then in the current scenario you will see a dip in your nav you will see negative returns and this is likely to continue so long as interest rates continue to move up so your 
fixed deposit returns i, I mean sorry fixed income returns particularly if you are holding in the form of uh, mutual fund uh, units might also experience negative returns simply because of the way the valuation is done all mutual funds have to do a mark to market and therefore the nas will dip however you should not be exiting those funds because now with increased yields the nav will increase at a higher rate having said that is it time for us to move from equity to debt answer is no yeah second gold now in the times we are in you know with a war going on since february any investor who is seen early uh, markets for a long time would say it's right time to invest in gold you know when everything uh, you know a war like situation happens then the one asset that shines bright and shoots up is gold and what we have seen is that it is not happened this year. you know gold has just about returned 8% now gold traditionally you know doesn't return very high uh, you know the returns are not very high it it matches inflation rates long term inflation rates but in times of crisis gold shoots up which has not happened now which is anomalous another you know uh, factor that should have actually you know uh, i don't know the lot of things that are linked up and we'll cover it in the next slide you know basic economics tells you that if a country experiences very high inflation then its currency has to depreciate you know inflation is nothing but fall in purchasing power of the currency and the united states of america is experiencing 40 year high inflation rates they never seen something like 9% inflation and despite that the us dollar continues to strengthen so that is another uh, issue again uh, so if the us dollar strengthens then the gold weakens you know uh, the one thing that actually decides gold value is the extent of uh, money that's created in the us uh, united states so we are in in a time where it, the traditional theories are not going to apply so if you are going to bide our time saying that okay till market stabilize i'll move from equity to gold you might probably miss the bus real estate is again a favorite of many investors and uh, you know it is perceived that real estate actually gives super normal returns because we talk of specific you know i bought a land here or i the prices of land in this particular year was so much it has gone up by so much it has given super normal returns etc now real estate is very different uh, asset category and we do not have one reliable index which actually tracks the market as perhaps a nifty or a sensex will track equity markets but there's one index that is created by national housing bank which is called uh, the uh, hpi uh, index that is housing prices index uh, again not that this is the last word in real estate prices but if you look at this index in india obviously it tracks indian real estate you will see that real estate has underperformed the highest return in the country is you know coming from bangalore and it has returned 20% over last 4 years delhi for all its high prices etc has given a negative return of 2% over the last 4 years as per this index so it's not and apart from that real estate comes with another package of you know committing large amounts of money and it gets blocked low liquidity etc etc and on and off some of you asked questions about crypto and you know what is happening there okay. so prices are going through the roof one day and then crashing like nobody's business the other day so actually manoj uh, uh, 
I think you have been consistent in saying that uh, stay away from crypto for the last two years that we've been. Uh, yes. Yes, uh, and uh, we retain uh, that. We retain uh, that uh, stand. Uh, the last and uh, for no other reason except that you know there is no fundamental basis of evaluating the worth of your holding. Yeah. Moreover, uh, you know, Bitcoin is now below twenty thousand. Uh, Ethereum, which was above four thousand uh, dollars. Uh, yeah. is now uh, so now we look at ram i mean i think that's everybody understands that space now uh, i mean the fall in prices there can yes. we move ahead yes okay so now coming to some basic fundamental questions so what drives markets there is so much of noise you know with 24 hour channels and uh, um, you know, online portals. Uh, in fact, I and Ram keep getting inquiries about our views on various sectors, how the markets are performing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There is so much of noise that is getting pumped up, and uh, you know, a, a very different kind of uh, environment is getting created. We have to, at the core level. Markets are driven by two factors, one quantitative, one qualitative. The quantitative factor is liquidity. If there is more money in the system, all asset classes will rise. If the liquidity gets squeezed, all asset classes will experience a decline. So liquidity drives markets. And if you have been attending our con calls over the last one, two years, etc. We've been maintaining that markets will bounce back very fast because the liquidity continues to come into the market. Now, what has happened over the last three months is that central banks all over the world have kind of come together and said, okay, we will bring the interest rates down and we'll squeeze out ex excess liquidity. So that liquidity that was for you know pushing the markets up, that suddenly is that that pressure that flow is no longer there, and that is the reason why you see markets sliding down. Otherwise, the markets would have bounced back with additional flow of money coming in. The markets would have bounced. Back. The qualitative factor is what an investor feels. I talked about optimism and pessimism when we looked at the PE charts. Today, you pick up any media report and the tone is decidedly negative. You know, there is so much of negativity that is being spread. You talk about any sector, any asset class, any company, the underlying tone is negative which is instilling fear in the minds of the investor. And that is a dangerous thing. And during bull markets, the same thing drives, uh, instills the sentiment of greed. And we do not look at anything else, but we simply want to buy and we want to make money. Every other thing, you know, talk of fundamentals, technicals, Every other thing ultimately leads to these two things. You have money, you will buy. You don't have money, you will not buy. Second, you feel things are going to go up, you will buy. You think things are going to come down, you will not buy, you will want to sell. Manoj, so these are the... Yeah. Yes, Ram. No, no, I continue, please. Yeah. So let us now look at these factors in greater detail. I, I just now talked about it. Liquidity is going to come under pressure over the near term. You know, the Fed is talking about increasing interest rates and it increases 75 basis points. Then the markets suddenly go up because it was unexpected lines and there's some other prediction, etc. Then after one hour, two hours, it starts sliding and there's some, some other explanation provided. But the fact of the matter is that we will see pressure on liquidity over the next few months at least what is what is causing this why are the central banks suddenly moving from an abundance of liquidity to 
containing liquidity because of inflation so long as the inflation levels were lower the central banks really didn't mind mind you no government wants higher interest rates because government is one of the largest borrowers of money so if interest rates go up governments have to cough up significantly higher amounts of money as interest so no government and therefore by extension no central bank favors rising interest rates but today they are forced to because inflation is shooting up much beyond the quote unquote their target level so if rbi says i am looking at 2 to 6% inflation has crossed 6% and this is inflation as per a particular index that the rbi is following on ground inflation could be much higher so the question is why is inflation going up largely driven by commodity prices and commodity prices are going up because there's a war going on so there is supply issues and uh, you know oil is one of the major things oil and gas these reasons are stoking inflation which is causing liquidity to get squeezed uh, leading to increase in interest rates noj uh, huh? in the past bear markets that we have seen in the us uh, and, and globally so um a fall in commodity prices has tended to coincide with the bottom of the bear market uh i am bringing this point up because uh, one repeated question we are getting and ravi rao has also asked something like this and there's one more question from iphone uh, around how do i retain gains in the portfolio you know basically the question is how do we know kitna downside hai aur nifty mein okay um so aur kitna gir sakta hai market is basically the question that people want to know so you know this slide we are saying yeah these are the factors etc but if we were to kind of you know hold the invisible crystal ball in our hand and dare put a number you know why don't you go ahead with some thoughts on that see the trigger for the markets to turn back will be when the war stops you know as we can see uh, from this uh, you know uh, going for the root cause uh, so to say the root cause of the market situation today is the ongoing ukraine russia war once some agreement is reached you will definitely see an uptick and you know if i have to make a guess the sensex will go up by 2000 points on the day the war stops actually uh, uh, one take i have on ravi's question is uh, if you see my my view is that lot of the this bear market is happening because of the global factors right manoj yes uh, india story is in, intact we have seen you know phenomenal numbers in terms of you know i think manoj has a slide on that coming up later i don't want to preempt him yeah. uh, but in the interest of the free flowing conversation i just wanted to because ravi's question came few minutes back if you compare the bottom of uh, s&p 500 and see what the pe was in that at that bottom and look at where it is now you could mathematically calculate that there is another 10 to 15% further pain in the us okay and if you extrapolate yeah something similar might happen in india another 10 to 15% and there was a slide that manoj showed earlier uh, about previous bear market falls and actually we are not yet there in terms of that number if you really see we have not yet touched 20% in terms of the nifty index uh does it mean we know exactly kitna girega kab girega we don't know because it's a fluid situation if tomorrow the war stops suddenly uh the market could just go up like overnight we don't know when certain geopolitical events will happen uh there is certain room the only thing i would know and i'm personally doing is trying to muster whatever cash is available and start putting it back into the market uh because the valuations are very attractive manoj yeah so 
uh, I think we covered this slide. So the quantitative factors I've told you. Only thing is when uh, you know uh, again uh, to give the quantitative answer to the question as to when can we see markets turning back. If the Fed also says that uh, you know by end of 2023 the increase in interest rates will stop and probably they'll start reducing interest rates beginning 2024. See. As I told you, one, governments don't like high interest rates. Two, take the last 20 years and the only strategy that central banks have followed whenever we have entered into quote unquote, you know, fears of recession or a recession, you know, where the growth is slowing down or there is a crisis is by opening the floodgates. So once again, interest rates will be cut, money will be pushed into the market, liquidity will shoot up. And then again, you will see that instead of this money actually going into productive uh, activities, will find its way into the market and markets will start going up. So uh, will when will this actually happen? Will it happen in 2023 or 24 or 25? Will depend a lot on, as you said, various factors, geopolitical and otherwise. But typically, the government and central banks will want lower interest rates and more liquidity into the system. The only people who suffer because of this are the pensioners and those who depend on fixed income, uh, you know, for interest rates, etc. The Otherwise, everybody is happy with lower interest rates. So that is how it works. But let's let's now go ahead and see the India situation. So, in all this gloomy news that comes on a daily basis, you still see that what we hear on the India front is very encouraging. India cannot be isolated. India will also be part of the global economy and we will also slide if the rest of the globe is sliding. So we are not saying that we are different and we will do differently etc. However, if you have to choose the geographies where the potential for growth, potential for capital appreciation is higher, where the capital which is available will find its way to countries where the indicators are positive. And if you look at Indian macros, a lot of positives you can see. There are some negative indicators also. But you see all over you, I mean, you don't have to look at RBI numbers or uh, some government institution to tell you this. Just look around and see if you are seeing economic activity. You know, discretionary spending. You know, if a person is facing pressure, you know, on monetary or financial terms, then the first thing that cuts is discretionary spending. Marriages, the big fat weddings are back with a bang. You know, and these marriages fuel a whole lot of economic activity. You know, if you look at a big fat wedding, there are so many industries attached to it and they earn their livelihood from this one event. And this is happening in a big way. Travel, tourism, these are again, tourism is a discretionary activity. You are seeing a clear uptick in tourism despite increase in aviation uh, fuel. So, you know, your GST numbers, your everything is pointing out towards economic activity not getting impacted as much as, you know, what happens is people talk of US. US is facing a very difficult time and that gets extrapolated to India. We have to draw a line and see, okay, what they are talking of regarding US, does that apply to India as well? And we have to take our call on that. The India will get impacted because as I said, money comes from the large investors from the West. And if the Western economies are having difficulty, then to that extent, money into India 
will not come and that will impact the markets but it is only a matter of time because this money has to earn return for its investors and if the us is not going to give returns then the money flows into emerging markets and india is the probably the best bet we are also seeing very high fdi in manufacturing sector earlier we used to say india is the back office of the world etc but post covid post uh, the disillusion with china and its policies india is being looked at as a viable alternative and there's a lot of money coming in what it means see manufacturing will have a lag time today somebody commits money tomorrow you will not see growth but there's a whole lot of economic activity that is going to happen in the manufacturing sector you know the atmanirbhar bharat or whatever the government wants to say you are seeing numbers which is going to support manufacturing and of all things consumer confidence is on a high you know with so much of uh, pessimism and negativity one would expect that consumers are not very happy about the situation but as per numbers consumer confidence is increasing so what we expect is near term we will still have challenges and that is primarily driven by liquidity your interest rates will continue to have an upward bias current account deficit is widening because oil prices are going up and exports are kind of slowing down we our exports have been robust but over the last two months there's a slow down in exports and while the central banks have talked about you know over a period of time inflation will come down and interest rates might you know at least they'll stop increasing or whatever they have also said that they will target liquidity and we have understood the reason for that this liquidity stokes inflation so this will continue and therefore over the next 3 months 6 months we will see a little bit of pain but when this tide will turn nobody can predict thankfully a normal monsoon has been predicted now a lot of uh, large parts of india have started receiving rainfall so agricultural production should be good this year and that has since food is one of the major contributors to inflation higher agricultural output would likely reduce the pressure on inflation so as we progress you know to medium to long term things look much brighter than what is being projected for today's scenario this decade will be the decade for india and today when we are having challenges on the uh, consumption front the government is rising to the occasion and pumping up cap, uh, money into the system through capital expenditure so government has called the bluff they are, they are uh, unafraid of a high fiscal deficit otherwise a high fiscal deficit should have resulted in lowering of india's credit rating and that would have led to a whole lot of problems but it's been two budgets now and despite that in fact one of the credit rating agencies actually uh, you know upgraded india's credit rating so the way india is seen as an investment destination is definitely changing and with more money coming into the markets we see markets doing very well over the medium to long term next slide ma'am okay so what do we do now ma'am you want to take it up i have already covered this actually yeah I, you already talked about the 25% probability thing i think yeah. it's it's difficult to take tactical calls on moving money in and out uh of the market uh, uh you know uh, long term investing requires patience and we have to you know see through this uh like i said i'm personally adding money now that valuation nifty pe is around 18 and 1/2 and uh, it could be a a golden opportunity actually to to do it yes times when everybody is scared when everybody looks like are kya hoga you know is it really bad is when you actually make the maximum money there is lot of historical 
uh, data which says that when nifty is below 22 three year returns are 20% plus when nifty p is above 25 then three year returns are much lesser so uh, steady investing staggered investing uh, is what we would recommend uh, difficult to predict already we are at a fairly historic uh, our nifty p is almost at the level of covid bottom uh, so there could be further pain 10% pain 10% fall could happen but we don't know when uh, we don't know what extent um, we know we are in a good uh, geography globally speaking and we know that we are holding good stocks which meet a stringent set of criteria yeah, we may get wrong a few stocks uh, out of the 20, 25 picks that we do. We may get three or four wrong. But broadly, directionally, if we are right, then, you know, in spite of this fall in market from August till now, we've seen a three year CAGR of uh, 25% uh, or at least 20% plus in our portfolio, which compares very well with Nifty. So we have to retain confidence in the strategy. We can always nitpick and say, usme, these two stocks didn't do well. Why did you not exit? Uh, either we were wrong, we were mistaken, or in hindsight, we are still right. Uh, but broadly speaking, when we go for companies which are consistently high return on equity, consistently high uh, go earnings growth, uh, you know, uh, then, uh, you know, directionally we'll get it right. Occasionally, there will be some stocks like, like Manapuram Finance, which which is in our portfolio. So uh, it has not been doing well, but the only reason why we've made an exception to our rule is because the valuation is very, very, very attractive for that stock. It's, it's P is five something. And uh, it continues to have a great brand. It continues to have a great franchise. Yes, there is competition from other gold financiers, new uh, upstarts who've come in, but uh, gold is, uh, 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 you know, Lending is a long haul business, just like investing. You can't come in a swashbuckling way into lending and say, Abhi main isko kar dunga, or I will make great uh, returns, uh, uh, you know, because the NPAs, when they hit, they will take the company down like anything. So both Manapuram and Mutut have been in this business for decades together, and they have extremely efficient operating engines. So it's a contra call we are taking by holding on to that stock in spite, though it's not meeting the fundamentals. Uh, so the, the, it's an exception we are making uh, out of the 20, 25 stocks that we have, one or two exceptions we will make uh, as, as uh, uh, equity research, uh, as investment advisors, we will take that call. Um, but by and large, uh, and actually we haven't talked about the Spark portfolio. Uh, the Spark portfolio has completed one year. It has generated a 25% return in the last one year, which uh, compares very well with, uh, 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 you know, the BSC small cap, but I'll just uh, show that. Um, yeah. So the spark portfolio as of today is, uh, this is before, uh, uh, you know, returns, fees, etc. It's it's twenty percent plus, whereas BSC small cap is just about positive, one to two percent. And uh, you know, this is the model portfolio. Investors' experience may vary depending on when they came. Of course, there has been a significant correction post December, but from a one-year standpoint, Spark has really done well. It has outperformed the BSC small cap. Um, so. Uh, that being said, uh, I think the last slide that we had was uh, that uh, we prefer to sit uh, tight and ride out the turbulence. Uh, nine months is too short a time frame to call it quits. Um, there will be a slow slide in the near term, but we, we can't time things. And, and you know we need to be patient uh, you know, with the market. Uh, on that note, uh, we will uh, close the call for now. If there are any questions, uh, feel free to reach out to uh, uh, Manoj or me. Uh, our IDs are, uh, my ID is ram at jamawealth.com. And you know all, you all know how to reach out to me uh, or with your relationship manager.
So we'll close the call. I don't see anything else open in the chat window uh, directed to me. Um, wish you a happy uh, weekend and uh, uh, stay invested. I won't say happy investing, I'll say stay invested. Bye.